it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ramon uh, Leon, who's in the uh, weed and biology uh, department of crop and soil sciences. He's an pro assistant professor of weed biology and ecology. Came to us in 2017 from Florida. Um, Costa Rican native, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, so actually, so Ramon and I met because he emailed Fred Gould after we published a review, after Fred and Jennifer and I published a review paper in Science on Pesticide Resistance, because Ramon had a very unique, you know, he was like, well, the weed resistance domain is a little bit, we, he was suggesting we may have missed a couple and perhaps misinterpreted some things, and that's, that's exactly, um, you know, welcome feedback for sure, and exactly the kind of reason to have a, have a speaker come to a GS colloquium to talk about on different views on this matter. And as I got to know him and looked at uh, looked at his work, um, I found it really interesting because not only you know is he a um, professor in this in this scientific field, um, but he's also done a fair amount of interdisciplinary work actually on on this issue of weed resistance. And he may talk about it, but they were uh, he's been part of this national uh, network of weed, of weed resistance uh, so people who've been looking at this problem and, and doing uh, listening sessions, which. To me, almost look like focus groups. I'm not yeah. uh, basically larger scale. Yes. Yeah, basically they're focus groups, um, and and so just really trying to under, understand this problem from a much broader perspective, I think, than um, than the traditional sciences might look at it. And so that that has led us to look at a couple of funding proposals and, and look at uh, possibilities for collaboration. And so I'm really excited to hear what he has to say to to the folks today. So that will hand it over. Thanks. Well. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Um, so thanks to GES first for, for the invitation. I, I'm really excited about this opportunity. Um, on my regular activities, I have to deal, if I like it or not, I have to deal with herbicide resistance, usually in very technical terms. But um, there is a whole story behind uh, herbicide resistant crops that a lot of people in the general public uh, it's not aware of just because they didn't have to deal with all the uh, details of how this technology was implemented. And some of the great things that uh, it allowed us to do and some of the challenges that we're facing now uh, or that uh, we're going to be facing a much larger scale in the coming years because of the way that technology was implemented. So what I want to do today is to tell you a little bit of my view of this whole process started also when I was a graduate student, uh, when we started to see herbicide resistant weeds evolved in. And all the conversations that happened um, back door, and perhaps the public were not, was not aware of that. So this is more like a testimonial of some of the stuff that uh, I personally have learned through the process. And also, um, hopefully, uh, a cautionary tale of some of the things that we might face for new herbicide resistant traits that are coming to the market or for potentially new uh, weed management tool that might be developed in the coming years. So bottom line is, uh, as the title says, uh, when we bring in a new technology that is exciting, that has a lot of potential to improve things, uh, we we're very optimistic. and, uh, and and humans tend to be very selective in what they want to see and what they want to acknowledge. And what I want to tell you today is that that's okay at the beginning, but we really have to be very critical of how we do these things for two main reasons. One is we want to make sure that the technology is successful and it's going to last for a long time. And two is because there are unintended consequences that might end up causing more problems than we anticipated or we didn't want to acknowledge at the time. Feel free to interrupt me if you have questions, okay? So, I always like to start with this question. How important are weeds? Anyone? 70% of all pesticide sales. Bob knows this, so I'll show that. He, he just messed up one of my slides. <laughs> okay. But that's okay, no, I appreciate that. Yes. It has, and, and it's a good point. So how do we actually assess it or, or answer this question? And that's a very tough question to answer. Some people say, well, they cause yield reductions. So how much yield reduction? Or how much is enough to alarm you? So let's consider from another perspective. Let's not worry about yields. Let's just see what people do. So this is the assumption that I have. Is if we invest a lot of resources, a lot of effort, a lot of time into something, it must be important, right? So, let's 
Bob Slime. So if we look at sales at the world every year, it's about $25 billion of sales of herbicides. Uh, in the U.S., it's about $5 billion uh, every year. And politically, you know that that $5 billion number is going up and down in the years. But so as a country, we invest about $5 billion a year, every year, uh, on herbicides. And you can see the proportion compared to other uh, pesticides like insecticides, fungicides, and fumigants. So the majority of those pesticides are actually herbicides. This is not something new, it's not something that just happened in the last 10 years. This has been the trend for a very, very long time. The big majority of those investments in pest control are basically herbicides. So even if I don't know anything about weed science, you know, I'm assuming well people put more money in what they need to solve, right? From the environmental perspective, so let's not say that it's just money. So how much pesticides are we putting out there every year? So again, uh, it's about 3 uh, billion pounds of active ingredient of herbicides worldwide and about 500 um, million pounds of active ingredient every year. And again, it's about a 2 to 1 with insecticides and about 3 to 1 ratio compared to fungicides. So not only from the financial perspective, but also from the environmental point of view, we're putting a lot of those active ingredients out there. Can I interrupt for one second? Yes. We're live streaming, and uh, if everyone can just do me this fast to say a favor and turn off the Wi Fi on your phones, we're having output issues again, and it's the, it's the room. Okay, so it's, all you have to do is turn off the Wi Fi. So Thank you. Go ahead. Sorry. No problem. And again, if we look at the historical trend, at least over the last 35 years, uh, it's very, very stable. So it seems that. At least the way that we have been growing major crops in the United States, herbicides have been a very important component of the investment and also the environmental impact that we're having for pest control. It's a lot of money, a lot of effort put into, uh, into the use of herbicides. That might be an erroneous assumption, but I would like to assume that we're doing this huge investment because there is a very big problem that must be dealt with. So, it seems that based on that, is the highest expenditure amount of active ingredient among pesticides in the U.S. and in the world. Okay? So, do you agree it's an important uh, problem? Are you willing to devote your professional career to this problem? <laughs> Raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> Three of us. Okay, the wind science group. And I want to bring that up because it seems that people don't get it. This is something that we should really tackle aggressively. Now, <laughs> some conspiracy theories, and, and, and basically my family and friends, <laughs> I have to justify my career to them every year, would say, well, you know, you, 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 use, you spend a lot of money on herbicides because pesticide companies have convinced us that there is a need to use them, uh, although that means it's not real, or it's not that important, right? So is that a valid point? Well, if you want to have dinner in my house, you have to say yes, it's a valid point. <laughs> and how do we answer, how do we address that? It's like, okay, I'm not gonna even try to argue against that. Let's see how people deal with weeds but there are no herbicides. So if there are no herbicides, if there are no companies selling them herbicides, then that factor of the equation is gone. So if weeds are really important, you're gonna have to deal with them one way or another without the herbicides. So let's go to developing countries. So we're talking about 500 million farmers, small farmers worldwide producing in many cases up to 80% of the food in those developing countries. OK? 
Okay? Have you hand waved before? Raise your hand if you have been hand waving once in a while. Okay, good. So there are several studies, but I'm just going to cite this one from Giller et al. 2009. So this is in Zimbabwe, two different systems. So they were comparing conventional tillage and uh, conservation tillage. But I want to see you this, this first gray color on top, that's the amount of time, number of hours per season they devote to harvest. Now harvest is a very intensive activity. The next one, the big one, is weeding. And the little one is planting, this black one is planting, and then fertilization. So it turns out, in most cases, once you average multiple studies, small growers throughout the world, in developing countries, spend half of their working time weeding. Now I want you to think about this from the poverty management perspective. Can you imagine the impact in poverty reduction if we can help those guys to reduce that time. Okay? Half of their working time is just weeding. So, yes, sir. So, so it's not that straightforward. So uh, poverty reduction. Well, it's all well and nice. That reduces the, the work time needed to you know, produce stuff yes. using agriculture. So if you were using organic, then you would have to have people weeding, you would have to pay them, and so on and so forth. So if we say this is helping us reduce poverty, it's a one-sided picture. I'm not saying it's not helping uh, in some shape or form reduce poverty uh, to kind of de dedicate that hours or that time to more well-paid jobs, but in, in certain instances it can mean a lot of people get out of work, right? really fast. Another you. point I wanted to make is, uh, you've made a point, I mean, I, I hope your family and friends like you, and you made a point that people do need to kind of deal with weeds uh, somehow or the other. But the other part of that picture is, uh, if we're dealing with weeds you know, in one way, does that increase the amount of fungi on the uh, finished product. So we'll be will we be eating weed that is moldy and so on forth. Whereas uh, as a response or as a as a result of our using of herbicides. So it's just a cautionary kind of Well I I'm disagree with that. So I'm not saying this is about herbicides at this point. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that the amount of labor that is invested <coughs> into weeding is the most important use of labor in those small farms. So, in areas where this has been addressed, there's been about one or two days of work labor a week that most of the time when they have been successful, uh, they devote to other activities like diversifying their, produ their production, marketing their production better, things like that. So, uh, it's, it's, it's true. There are other consequences, not straightforward. What I want to highlight is the fact that it's huge, it's extremely large. And, and, and could be addressed either through herbicides or through other means. In many cases, this has been addressed more through mechanical tools. But it's a major issue. So I appreciate that, that, that comment. Now, they seem to be important. So is it reasonable to think that weed management is a priority of our society? What do you guys think? Well, yes, but you've so far only mentioned agriculture, and weeds are also an enormous issue for conservation purposes. My brother's an invasive plant manager, and that's his sole concern, is which weed is showing up and how we invite Yeah. But I mean... Many of those are associated with agriculture. That would add on to this. Yes. I'm just mentioning agriculture. Yes, I'm making the case that... It's, it's more than that. Definitely it's more than that. But so... This is a priority for our society. Well, I would say um, it does not seem to be, given what, also how you started your talk about um, how little we know about this. Um, yeah, so I would say no. And it turns out, just to give you an idea, financially we're putting a lot of money into it. But to, to deal with that problem as a whole, 
Uh, I personally think that is not a priority based on what we see. USDA, the USDA has no wheat scientist position, for example. Okay? Wow. So it's a, That's right. there's, there's no wheat scientist in the USDA. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations had one, and he retired about 15 years ago and it was never replaced. Uh, well, so there, there are two points about this. Number one, we know a tremendous amount about it, but it's sequestered in a fairly small community. Okay, the second one is the whole thing about USDA positions. This has been a strategic objective for WSSA for 20 years. With and, Science Society yeah, of America. And I think it's a key one, okay? And I've served on several panels uh, because in USDA, entomology and weed science are lumped. Because in their system, the money goes to entomology and weed science is a footnote. Although the actual needs are almost reversed. Really, in terms of money, money expended. And you know, I would just say this at this point, rather than getting the whole thing about USDA. The control of weeds is an absolute cynic on for our society. When we lose herbicides, we're going to find that out, and we are in trouble. So, and, and this is something important to understand. For us, the wood science that work in this area, we live with this reality all the time. But uh, it's just almost absurd, the fact that I just showed you the numbers, how much money the country pays for these things. And it's almost no one working on it. So we have delegated, as a society, the solutions to basically industry. Uh, and, and we'll see some of the consequences of that. Okay? And I'm not saying industry doesn't do a good job, but they have certain specific priorities related to their business. So this is how we get to herbicide resistant crops. Over the last 25 years or so, that has been the most important tool that industry has provided for weed management, at least for developed countries and large scale row crop production. Okay? So, what are those? Those are crops that have been genetically engineered to have high levels of resistance to herbicide, but otherwise would be lethal. So, basically, they took herbicide that already existed and then created artificially selectivity, what we call selectivity. We have been using herbicides on crops for a long time. It's just in this case, they just were able to identify um, a transgene that was inserted and confer resistance predominantly, or, or, or first of all, to glyphosate, which is what um, some colleagues of, of us have called the once in 100 year herbicide. So glyphosate is by far the, the most desirable herbicide for weed control. It has a very broad spectrum of control, that means that it controls a lot of different species. Uh, it's systemic, so it moves inside the and it reaches the root. So it gives a lot of flexibility for weed control. That's why Monsanto originally went after that herbicide. Uh, however, we have other traits, glufosinate resistant and currently 2,4-D and dicamba uh, uh, are used. Main crops, soybean, corn, and cotton. Why those? For the simple fact that those represent the largest acreage. Not because they had the most big problems at the time when the technology was developed. It's just the largest market for seed companies, the largest market for herbicide companies. Most of the herbicide discovery is done in function of those three crops. There are a lot of herbicides that will help a lot of other crops, but those usually don't make it to the market just because the sales uh, are too small to justify the effort for registration and developing a, uh, a distribution strategy. So just to give an idea how important, this is uh, glyphosate resistant soybeans from 1995, 96, all the way to 2013. This really doesn't happen in agriculture too often. That in about five years, you go from almost zero to 75% of the market and 10 years, you're about 95% of your acreage. This is a huge adoption rate. Unprecedented in agriculture. Not even the Green Revolution was that fast. This is kind of like iPhone kind of sales in the agricultural world. It really changed the way agriculture was conceived by farmers and specialists. So this is an unbelievable 
adoption rate. That is very hard to explain just by the trade. In fact, we have that level of adoption despite the fact that there were lower yields, higher costs, and lower profits. Economists didn't want to talk about it. They just say, ah, oh, that's something. No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> so, how can you explain this? How can you explain that farmers all of a sudden already having a very small market profit, uh, a market, uh, profit margin, sorry, were able to say, you know, I'm going to pay for a more expensive variety that yields less, and I'm going to make less money because it's the new technology. I can think of two possible reasons. Yes, sir. One is that it saved people time. And it they saved time. people time. And the second is that they hated weeds. But there was a cultural phenomenon here. So the, there were a few studies at the time, and you're completely right. There were first studies at the time uh, where basically the non, uh, non transgenic lines were out yielded the transgenic lines. There are two explanations for that. One is that those transgenic lines, uh, Monsanto and Pioneer at the time, they were trying to get to the market as quickly as possible, said so they, they didn't have the trade in all the best performing lines. So there was a yield drag. That took about, I would say, five to seven years to, to fix. The other thing is that growers all of a sudden decided, you know, this is great. I can just go once and trade those weeds rather than going five times, but they used to do before, three to five times per season. And one shot at Randa will kill those big weeds. The problem is that if they did that, those weeds had already reduced yield. So that was another reason why the, the yield went. Uh, so they realized, well, I cannot just do once. I have to do, go twice with Randa to spray those weeds. But, but definitely, it really changed. It. The, the value of time, we had not considered. So even economists at the time had to realize, well, there is a lot of stuff that we're not measuring. It's not just. It's not just how much money they're going to make. So there were a lot of benefits. Because of that free time or extra time, they, there was an increase in acreage on their no-till and conservation tillage. So all of a sudden, the need to go and cultivate the fields was eliminated for some of these crops. You can just go with Roundup. There were fewer passes through the fields, so there were a lot of diesel savings. So that was very beneficial. It was less dependence on soil moisture and uh, variability. One of the major challenges for production, when you even use pre-emergence herbicides, is to have the right moisture in the soil for these things to work. If you're going to do cultivation, if you're not going to spray herbicides, but you're going to cultivate, soil moisture is critical. To have that right time where the soil moisture is perfect so that you can go and, and, and cultivate your field is challenging in many areas. And you have to do twice, three times that practice. So all of a sudden, all those issues are resolved, which allowed a lot of farmers, basically, to increase their operation size. They now could rent more land. They could farm more land because it's a lot easier. Rather than going five times over their farm, now they can just once or twice, and then have the other two days to do another farm. There were simpler herbicide programs this is something uh, that was not intended, but all of a sudden you have a herbicide that kills all your weeds. Why are you going to put something else? Right? An extra cost, an extra pass if your roundup is going to kill it. So they started to eliminate some of the other herbicides that were part of the integrated weed management. And then there was flexibility to control large and perennial weeds. So now we could be uh, less accurate on timing and just, I'll kill it when I get there. So it really made things easier. At the time, and this is late 90s, early 2000s, there is this sense that, gosh, we fixed the weed problem. This is like the polio vaccine. I mean, that was that sense of accomplishment. And it's like, great, we did it. Well, we did it, but you know, we all took credit for it. The problem is that because we were so happy and so optimistic how things were going, 
then we started having other consequences that we probably should have anticipated and we had the information for it. We were just too excited and we're too positive about that new uh, production system. So there was a reducing investment in new herbicides and weed control techniques. Many herbicide companies cut down funding on discovery of new herbicides. So like, why are you going to keep investing you know, 400, 800 million dollars per herbicide if glyphosate is killing everything with one or two shots? So many companies actually decreased or eliminated their herbicide discovery uh, units or divisions. You hear this from farmers all the time. Roundup ready crops made battered mediocre farmers to look good, to get by. So all of a sudden, you didn't even have to know how to farm. You could do it, and your farm will look okay. So a lot of people that traditionally would not be successful farmers because they were not paying attention, they were not doing things carefully, uh, were able to get by. And actually many farmers would blame them for some of the herbicide resistant issues that we have nowadays. Can I ask a question about that? Yes. Um, given that this took place in the late 90s and early 2000s, is there a sense that there's been a certain kind of farm knowledge that was lost because of Herbicide. I'll get to that one. Oh, sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, dinner, uh, yeah. You're right. Yeah. It happened. Okay. We lost a generation, actually, <laughs> and, uh -huh. uh, of people that knew how to do integrated with management. So I, as extension specialist, I have trained kids that are in their late 20s, that are, you know, grew up uh, with their parents that were teenagers in the 90s that have no idea how to use a cultivator. They have no idea how to use a pre-emergent herbicide. They have no idea that you're supposed to rotate crops to manage pests. They, I mean, I have trained kids on some of the most basic things that farmers will feel offended. Uh, you tell them, you know, this is what you're supposed to do to do things right. Uh, I could not believe it, but we lost an entire generation of people that knew how to integrate different practices to manage needs. The other thing that we did not anticipate is that that huge adoption made things so uniform in the landscape. But we have this huge selection lab for resistance. Um, and then we ended up with glyphosate resistant weeds and weeds that evolved resistance or, or adaptation to other things. Yes, sir. So, so here's the deal. I have issues of omission and issues of not kind of following the logical consequences of mediocre bed farmers. Right? So yeah. mediocre bed farmers, you don't have to work hard, you don't have to know anything, and you'll be good as a farmer, right? Trade on you, you'll be able to make money out of you'll be money. Made, yes. That's cool. Depending on whether you have the funds to do to get the roundup and, and so on and so forth. So this decreased the amount of labor that is necessary. We can agree on that that it can be good, right? On the other hand, let's look at the numbers. How many farmers stayed farmers? And how many of them actually had to look for jobs elsewhere? Did this actually help farmers <coughs> in, in large? as a, like a trend, or did it actually devastate small firms? So what happened? Did it lead to kind of uh, huge companies buying off more and more land and so on and That's the first point. The second point is the use of a uh, single sort of large scale like thing, right? So glyphosate kills off a lot of wheat. That's good. We don't have to have a specific herbicide for this wheat. We don't have to have specific herbicide for that wheat. But what else does it kill? Uh, the, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I'm concerned about the effects glyphosate has on our microbiome because it kills a lot of stuff. And if we eat that thing, then all of the bacteria that were very, very beneficial for humans that were producing all sorts of nutrients that we are used to are no longer in our gut. Or if we look at the earth itself, uh, are the bacteria that were supposed to be doing stuff within that earth, are they there to do that, or they have been killed off by, by glyphosate? 
Well, history teaches us a lot of lessons. So back in the day, Egypt used to be the wheat basket of the world. They used to have three uh, harvests. Now they have none. They're desert. Why? Because they over over till their land, and now it's dead. It's a desert. Uh, if we look at the sort of monoculture soybean um, sort of sprayed with glyphosate places, it looks like a desert to me. It looks like very sandy, very you know. I, I mean, I'm not an expert, but I, I have concerns about where we're going with this. Yes, yes, uh, and. In this case, going to the first point, uh, what happened, and it's not just a consequence of random Brady crops, it, it's just a trend of uh, the, the market and the, the uh, smaller margin profits that the farmers have. We have fewer farmers in the U.S. That, that has been the trend for sure. Uh, this actually enabled some of those guys that have more capital to keep their bigger. So we ended up having Thanks to these technologies, the ability to farm really large extensions. I, when I was in Iowa, I had a friend that grew up in a 400-acre farm, and thanks to this technology, his dad moved into a 3,800 uh, farming operation. A lot of those farms or farmers could have been displaced. The reality is that many of them are just renting land, so they kept the land. They decided, I'm not, "This is not a good business for me. I'll just get some money and rent the land." Um, so yes. We've seen that uh, transition. Yeah, just a second to, to add that. Uh, the second point is a little bit more, more complex. Um, in fact, when we look at the impact of glyphosate, for example, soil microbial communities, uh, depending on the system, we actually increase microbial activity because we allow more biomass to get into the system. Okay. Um, Compared to traditional conventional system where you have pre-emerging herbicides and more cultivation, the fact that you're allowed to go to a no-till conservation tillage, you're allowing more organic matter production into the system. Having said that, yes, when you have these uniform systems, just herbicide applications all the time, you reduce a lot your your uh, diversity in the system for sure. Yes. Um, so this is this idea of mediocre or bad farmers uh, is captivating for me, and I'm wondering if, um, because having hung out with people in all kinds of fields who talk constantly about whether or not rewards are being appropriately distributed to the hard-working people, um, I'm wondering if there was a kind of demoralization where people felt like, you know, that rewards are not being distributed to the people who really deserve it. In, in rewards, in, uh, rewards in, in what sense? Well, that if mediocre or bad farmers are turning, you know, small plots into large plots or, or making money, but maybe really good farmers are not being valued in the new system, whatever, yes. however all these are defined, is, was there a, a certain demoralization or contention within the farm community? Hold that thought. We'll get there. We, we'll talk a little bit about that. But yes, so... <laughs> That actually oversimplification of the system, uni making a uniform landscape, uh, reduction in the diversification of our crop rotations or the species that we had, uh, created an environment for huge selection for resistance, not only for evolution, but also for the spread of other, uh, some of these issues in that more uniform landscape. So <clears throat> this is a graph of the number of species that have evolved resistant to different types of herbicides. So this one right here, this is for the system 2 inhibitors, atrazine, which is widely used uh, in the Midwest. This is ALS inhibitors, uh, which is probably the most diverse set of herbicides, and this was the great big news for the weed management world in the early 90s. But very quickly we started seeing a very high rate of evolution to uh, a resistant evolution. Very, very high rate. So here is where, right here, is where random ready cross were introduced. Okay? So I want you to pay attention to two things. One is we have plenty of cases of resistance be before random ready crops. We knew it was possible. Okay? And it could <coughs> be a problem. The way that we were handling that is that if it became resistant to this mode of action, 
then we'll use this one to kill it. And once it's resistant to that one, we'll use this one to kill it. And so on and so forth. The problem is that we haven't had a new mode of action in about 30 years, 35 years. So by the time we hit this point, there's no new mode of action coming to the market. Call it bad luck, call it karma. That's a reality. So when Randa Brady crops came in, right here, there are no cases of resistance. By the time, glyphosate had been in the market for more than 20, 25 years, and not a single case of resistance. So our optimistic view said, oh, it's not going to happen in glyphosate. As it happened, it's not going to. Actually, Monsanto tried to find resistant plants for a long time. It was very hard for them. So the transgene actually is based on bacteria, on a bacterial EPS PC based gene. They were not able to find through mutagenesis resistant plants. And the assumption was that the, the fitness penalty of having these resistant plants so big that it's not going to happen. Okay? So that was the logic at the time, even though we had this whole evidence that it happens for every single mode of action. <coughs> so we had about 12 mode of actions that it actually had happened. Why did, we be, why did we base our assumptions on an exception and not prepare for that event, right? And as soon as we moved to that huge, uniform landscape, not only in the US, but also in Brazil and Argentina, and now we're treating every year half of the country with glyphosate twice per season at the same time. It's a straight line up of selection. It happened. Okay? Now, this was Australia, and, and we always blame Australia for having a lot of herbicide resistant issues, so we just blame it on them. And, and it's an island, so that's fine. It could happen to them. We didn't worry too much. This goosegrass case was in Malaysia. It was something weird. Must have to study it. It's like, well, Plants are not growing too well, but when it happened here, this is Conaisa Canadense, that was Delaware, mm -hmm. uh, about 2000, 2001. A weed species that is dispersed by wind. In less than three years, it was all across the entire country. <laughs> dispersed throughout the entire country. Why did we do this? Did we freak out? Not pretty much. No, Bob. We, we, we kept a, debating and deal. debating a, and debating no, what to do. But it was a big deal about dealing because it was a direct threat to conservation too much. It was a direct threat to conservation too much. But here's the, here's the catch. There were no concrete actions taken. We were concerned. No, As no, weed no, scientists, no, yeah. The companies were a little bit concerned, and I would argue more about their sales. No one wanted to pull out that product from the market at the time. No one wanted to contain the use of the trade. We just gave recommendations to mitigate the problem. Regardless that this is one of the most flexible and valuable herbicides that we had based on what you find in the literature. So, look at this. This is number of unique resistant cases in the United States. It almost looks like a straight line, right? Is it over? And I have some friends say, well, it's literally not final. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and no, and I, look, I got excited too. That, you know, when you see that flat point there, you say, oh, finally, we got there. But the reality is, that has just one mechanism of action per plant. Now we reach the age in where we're counting plants that have two, three, four, five mechanism of action. So now we have plants that are resistant to most herbicides in an entire production system. So for example, for me that I work on peanut production, we base a lot of our Management. We started with ALS resistant, uh, ALS 
ALS herbicides here. Now we have ALS resistant weeds. Then we move to PPO resistant, which is uh, this one right here. And now we have PPO resistance. We rotate it with content that use glyphosate and we have glyphosate resistance. So now we have, for example, peanut is one of the crops in the southeast that in the next three to five years will have no functional herbicides. Five minutes, okay. Why is that? And, and, and if you look at the uh, insecticide literature, it's more about, well, you have fitness penalties or fungicide literature. So if you stop using the pesticide, naturally the weeds are going to go back. Oh, sorry, the, the pest is going to become susceptible again. So you can play with that. The DT concept of having refuge for uh, non transgenic refuse is based on that fitness penalty. We have not seen that in weeds, in which we have no fitness penalty for any practical purposes. One of my students uh, did a study, we sampled multiple populations of Palmer, we found actually the resistant ones, glyphosate resistant populations grow more than glyphosate susceptible populations. It's not a direct effect of the trade, but it's a consequence of the uniform selection system that we have. And we found that that increased growth is due to a higher nutrient use efficiency. It's about 40% higher. So with the same amount of nutrients, those weeds that are glyphosate resistant now actually grow more. I used to dispute this whole concept of super weeds. I hated it. Uh, and then my own data kind of like uh, uh, backfired here. But the reason is for this, is we have these such uniform systems that allows the evolution of other life history traits that will make these weeds more complicated. So we ask growers, and we created these, uh, because now we're, we're really concerned. So we've had these recessions nationwide with farmers, with uh, crop advisors, with insurance companies, with weed scientists, agronomists, and ask them, what are their, their opinions about weeds, uh, herbicide resistant management? We actually finally, after 20 years of issues, partnered with sociologists and economists to get a different perspective. And we found, and this is what they said, we need new herbicides, especially new mode of actions. This is after having major scientists from all the herbicide companies telling them, we have no new mode of actions. And they said, don't worry about it. We'll simplify regulation, I'll you discover them. It's like, we don't have them. We need to deal with the problem. And farmers still say, we need the new mode of action. That's the solution to our problem. So it, it's not a technical solution, it's a psychological perception. Then they said, there is no need for more regulation. At the beginning, they started talking about, you know, we need more regulation, which I was surprised, because this is something they had opposed a long time. Because finally, they recognized that there is a regional and local phenomenon. It doesn't matter if you manage your farm properly. If your neighbor is not doing things correctly, it will affect you. So they said, well, we need, more, we need to force those guys to do things correctly. And once I, you know, I told him, look, that's great. I'm surprised you're bringing this up. You, you, you realize that they might regulate you too. He said, no, 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 not me. I, 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 don't, I don't need regulation. It's the other guy. It's like, well, the, the laws don't, don't work like that. And then they said, well, there, there's, we don't need regulation. We, we, we should, what we need is more education. And they said, but for the other guys, because I'm doing things correctly. So we're still in that scenario where where now there's more awareness of the, the difficulties that we face with, the, with these uh, technologies and herbicide services and evolution, but people don't want to cooperate to solve the issue at this point. And they say diversity is very difficult, and it's true. Integrated weed management, crop rotation, diversifying your crop system, diversifying your management strategies is more difficult. We're asking farmers to do things that are more difficult than what they want to do. And they say, well, the current agricultural economy makes it difficult to do things differently. They need more money. They cannot, they don't think they can do what it takes to manage this problem or to implement and use these technologies properly with the money they're getting for their operations. So 
And the other thing is, we are aware of herbicide service system, but are managing it, and we are not in a panic. Which I would think just blew my mind. I mean, I, I'm, when we're talking to guys that almost lost their farms, that, that they were this close. I said, no, but, but we're okay. It's like we're denying the nightmare that we're living in some of these situations. That's what I said that uh, I don't know who's freaking out. I don't, I don't see people freaking out about these problems. So, so the day before Pearl Harbor, the belief was the Japanese are reasonable and will not attack. There you go. Well, in this case, even though farmers that have been close to losing their operations, many of them feel that things are still manageable based on these run assumptions that herbicide, new herbicides will come along soon, and that somehow they won't need to go to a more complex system. And to some extent, then this happens. So we're finally incorporating these new integrated approaches, then companies brought 2,4-D resistant crops, which is a herbicide that degrades, toxifies 2,4-D, uh, and dicamba resistant crops that toxify dicamba. These are broadleaf herbicides, uh, and, and they can control glyphosate-resistant weeds, okay? So, grower said, you see, I was, I was right. New technologies are coming, I don't need to diversify my system. <coughs> so, these are new transgenic crops for old herbicides. Herbicides that have been in the market for more than 45, 50 years, okay? They develop uh, mainly to control glyphosate and ALS resistant weeds. They only control broadleaf weeds, so they have a much limited spectrum compared to glyphosate. And there are multiple cases of resistant weeds already. So if we have to come on some, some slag, when they introduced random breeding crops, there were no glyphosate resistant weeds. These ones, we have plenty of 240 and Macambo resistant weeds already. <clears throat> what are we doing differently this time? More of the concerns about drift. You probably have heard that in the news. That that Canva is hurting other crops. You don't hear a lot about real solid strategies to manage resistance. There are more aggressive recommendations of pre-emergent residual herbicide, just recommendations. We were pushing to require using integrated approaches. But it's just a recommendation at this point. Uh, there's some requirements to report scapes from the side of the companies, not the growers. And there's no clear strategy to counter selection. So we are going to be, again, there are hundreds of thousands of acres that are going to be planted every year with that Campa 2 for deer resistant crops. Same strategy as glyphosate. So we have a lot of selection, but we're not doing much to counter that. And then what are we going to do when we run out of herbicide resistant traits? Unless we have new molecules coming to the market, which based on the last three decades, it hasn't happened. Once we run out of those three mode of actions, then what? And the rate that we have seen these this technologies last about five to eight years at a time. So it seems to me that we're still being way too optimistic. We're still not taking these issues seriously. And it works bad for both sides, for whatever, whoever wants the technology to work and make money for them, they're gonna lose the technology. And from the environmental point of view, or the integrated with management, it's a problem for us because we are breeding weeds that are more difficult to control. So what is needed? I guess that there's a wide consensus that incentives are needed. Farmers, they are not receiving the financial support they need. It seems that they're not going to be able to implement this up, uh, best management practice. More herbicides, they're actually Papers published in December saying that herbicide, we really need more herbicides. Probably it's true, but uh, again, looking at history, we should pay more attention to what's happening. Innovation with management, finally, we're seeing a little bit more innovation, so we're seeing more robotics and UAVs technologies. Uh, I don't know how they're going to turn out to work at the large scale. We need more biotechnologies traits beyond herbicide resistant traits. And the scientific community has been very weak in really targeting weed management issues from the biotechnological point of view. We're decades behind entomologists on the use of technologies like RNAi or uh, genetic for gene drive for weed management. 
Uh, and then we need to revolutionary perspective of weed adaptability. We need to think this at a much larger scale and temporal scale. We need to project what's going to happen in five, ten year periods, not if we're going to be able to manage it this season only, which is the current approach, actually. And then I would say we need a bit less optimism, unfortunately, a lot more pragmatism and self-criticism uh, as an agricultural and scientific community. Because definitely it seems to me that we're repeating the same mistake with this new technology, the 248 Dicamba, that we did with glyphosate, despite the fact that we should know better. So I'm going to stop right there and thank you very much for, for your attention. I don't know if we still have time for questions. So let me just ask for uh, questions from people who haven't already asked a question during the presentation. Okay. Although I am going to continue the line of humanists and social scientists who are bugging you. Um, so I want to go back to the beginning where you, um, where you um, established the importance of the problem by relying on economic choices. Yes. Um, and it has come up a couple of times. There are also cultural factors that are driving people's hatred of weeds. You can't talk to farmers in Iowa for very long without getting a sense of fence row farming. You want your farm to look good yes. from the road. And that means no weeds. And I once had a, a guy that had just made the transition to organic tell me long stories about how he had to work with his uncle to get his uncle to recognize the beauty of a little bit of a messy field. So I'm wondering, um, could you put on your list of what is needed reframing? Are there weeds that are actually not so bad or maybe even good? OK, great point. Um... Love the weeds. <laughs> you know. As a weed ecologist, I actually live you know, work with the weeds, right? And I, I've done a lot of work on biodiversity, the role of weeds as, as drivers of biodiversity and agroecosystems. So I agree with that perception. Um, but, it, but it's true, we have two levels of, uh, of concerns about weeds. One is the impact on yield, and I'm talking from the farmer's perspective. Uh, and the other one, that aesthetics requirement is, there's some pride in it to have a clean, a clean farm. Um, However, that's not, the main, that's not the main concern. The main concern is that uh, we don't know how many weeds we can tolerate. So most farmers will assume, and actually for herbicide resistant management right now, then the threshold is zero. So you should aim for zero weeds, otherwise you might be in trouble. Um, so a, a clean field not only looks good, but also ensures that you're gonna have certain uh, it's all farmers are more along those uh, lines that like to look uh, to see the fields clean because they could okay we don't have such a thing nowadays most farmers have herbicide resistant weeds so they have scapes all the time they, they very few can afford to have a really clean pristine field anymore um, so in the last few years that perception has decreased but it, it, it's true, I had, we, we worked with a, with a farmer in Iowa that helped us develop thresholds. So we had about eight years of data in his farm, how many weeds he could tolerate and still get the same yield. So his wife called us once, he's like, you need to talk to Bob. <laughs> so it turns out that Bob was very restless. He just walked the field and see a few weeds and drove in crazy, he was straight. This is like a 68 year old man. So we, we really didn't want to have in our conscious any, any, any side effects there. So we told you know, you know it's not, I mean, you're going to waste time, diesel, but if you want to go and cultivate it, be my guest. That man was so happy to jump in that tractor and just go back and forth through his field. That's fine. I mean, happiness and, and psychological stability is, is valuable. But, uh, but yes, it's a, it's a very complex problem. Now, it, and it's not technical in many cases. It's, we have to really understand that psychological or sociological component to it. Yeah, I would just add that as a bullet point that's oh, yeah. needed, cultural, culture change. Yes, yeah. So as someone who studies insecticide resistance, it kind of blows my mind that you're saying that there are no fitness costs to resistance in weeds. Mm -hmm. Yes, Can you explain? Okay, um, <laughs> a little more. there are just a few reports of fitness family. One is uh, is uh, resistant to system two inhibitors. 
because it actually slows down photosynthesis. So this is the only one that has been documented. Mm -hmm. The rest of the resistance, we have not seen a fitness penalty. Now, there are two possible explanations for that. In most cases, uh, it's just the way the mutation was generated just doesn't affect the functioning of the enzyme. In the other case, is that fitness penalty is, in most cases, evolution is not static. So you might have a fitness penalty, but if your genome evolves in other areas, it will compensate for it. So this is what we documented here, that glyphosate resistant, there are conflicting, um, conflicting uh, descriptions. Some people have found a little bit of uh, fitness penalty. Most people have not found any. But these are not new emerging events. This is after several years. So what we have found is that in those glyphosate resistant populations, the genome evolved too in that selection system. And now it actually is more efficient using nutrients. So even if there was a, a fitness penalty by the trait or the mutation per compared resistance, a parallel evolution or, or a coevolution in the system would compensate for it. So we have, we have a very, very complicated scenario. In the case of photosystem to uh, um, resistance, even when there is a fitness penalty, they stop using the herbicide, and actually that was done by Fred Yelverton, I think, here, uh, for about 15 or 17 years. And so, and this is in Poana. So it was about 98% of the population was resistant. So they stopped using that herbicide for about 17 years, came back, treated the population, and it was still 95% resistant. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact of there was a fetus penalty. So we add, in our, in our system, it's even worse because we don't have new chemicals coming to the market. So we kind of, as right now, we, we hit a dead end. So we don't have new chemistry, and we're losing whatever is functioning. So to me, uh, to keep an optimistic view of things, it's borderline fake. It's moving into a completely new, uh, outside the scientific realm. And, and it's a, a major concern. And I'm really, I'm really concerned about the future of agriculture in the next 20 years if we don't figure something out. It's gonna be a huge crash uh, for our production systems. And on that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> Great example of being able to engage, um, you know, the intersect intersection of science and technical work, and as you said, sociology and, and farmer culture and things like that. So thanks for helping us have a great conversation. Um, thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next week for a conversation about the Ag Bio Peace Program. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was fantastic.